is due a week from today. So make sure that you devote some time, if you haven't done it already, that you devote some time this week in order to get that done. Um, and hopefully those people who have done it uh, haven't encountered any particular problems or anything while doing it. Um, if you do, let me know. Hopefully the instructions are clear as to where to go. Okay, so to wrap up the look at dinosaur and census before we move on to dinosaur behavior, um, there's been some work done trying to reconstruct whether or which fossil animals were diurnal, that is active during the daytime, nocturnal, active during the night, or ephemeral, which is actually among uh, many mammals, the most common mode, but you don't hear about it. And that's animals that are active both at day and night. So those of you who got cats or dogs know what I'm talking about. But in fact, it's true of uh, most hoof mammals, most big predators and so forth, they're ephemeral. Now, the way this has been approached is what looks to be an osteological correlate. So remember, something that is preservable as bone that correlates with a particular behavior in this case, it's the relative size of the sclerotic ring, which are a ring of small bones that are in front of the eyeball, um, and they help form the shape of the eyeball. And then the pupil, and the way you estimate the maximum pupil size is the inside of the sclerotic ring. Now, we can't actually do this for mammals, which we'd really like to do. We can't because mammals lost their sclerotic ring. We, we had it in early synapsid ancestors, but it's been lost long ago. But among modern lizards, snakes, um, crocodilians, turtles, birds, so sauropsids, uh, this pattern does seem to, uh, to hold out. So here we have examples of knowns. So we've got a diurnal monitor lizard and a nocturnal gecko. And you see that. Uh, nocturnal forms tend to have thin sclerotic rings and gigantic pupil areas. And then here in terms of a spectrum, a diurnal modern bird, that's a red-tailed hawk, a cathemeral heron, active at day and night, and a potu, uh, which is nocturnal. So, after measuring a batch of data from extant animals, some paleontologists tried to reconstruct the um, behaviors of extinct dinosaurs and pterosaurs. And they found the majority of them were cathemeral. So here is Protoceratops is cathemeral, Diplodocus is cathemeral. A few were strictly diurnal. Archaeopteryx came out as strictly diurnal. A few were nocturnal. Interestingly, Velociraptor turned out to be nocturnal under this method. Now, this was an analysis from about 10 years ago. I forgot to leave uh, to put the author's name on this one. But it's been updated earlier this year. New studies of the relative, relative proportions of the sclerotic ring. And we see now more of a spectrum. And so we see this, um, you see the, the color going bluer for nocturnal and greener for less likely nocturnal. And then this newer one, we find a bunch of creatures down here which show very little evidence for it. So like the plotic is not nocturnal at all. Erlichosaur, so that is a uh, therizinosaur. But, we see scoring very high in terms of the nocturnal form. Haplochirus and Shavuya, who are those? Those are alvarosaurs, which were not included in the original study. And they're showing up in the same sort of field as um, Capromolcus, nightjars, uh, geckos, which are nocturnal lizards, and so forth. And curiously, in the same paper, um, they also looked at not only the uh, sclerotic ring, but something I talked about last time, which was sensitivity to sound based on the shape and size of the inner ear structures. And it turned out in both these studies, the group that came out as most nocturnal and most sensitive to sound were alvarosaurs, of all things. So alvarosaurs used to be a really obscure group of dinosaurs. They are still weird, whatever they're doing. But they turn out to be potentially nocturnal and very sensitive to sound on a level comparable to barn owls, which are among the best hearing birds, the best hearing animals in the modern world. And 
And so, as I joke, this was like an alvarosaurus. And here is a, a intentionally uh, a barn owl looking model, not to say that they did that. Now, why might they be really good at, uh, at hearing? Well, if they were indeed insectivores that I talked about, uh, when I talked about them as a group, uh, being able to hear insects within their uh, holes, within wood, within their nests or whatever, might be a very helpful thing. So, new information. Then finally, uh, the last sense I want, the last sense I'm going to address, I was gonna say I was gonna touch on, but, is the sense of touch, which is one that is actually really hard to get to. Touch and taste are, are senses for which there are no osteological correlates. And even inside the brain, it's hard to find the centers that are associated with that in, in an endocast. So those are still sort of territory that are hard to explore. The one thing I do want to address is a hypothesis by Persons and Curry that maybe our thoughts about how the proto feathers in the lineage ultimately leading to birds arose um, should be uh, uh, speculated as beginning with other than insulation. So remember the standard model begins as insulation and, and display, and then eventually you get penaceous feathers maybe for brooding and ultimately for wing-assisted incline running and control flapping descent, and then within some of the animals that had that power flight. Well, one observation is that there are modern birds that use some of their facial feathers as whiskers, that is, as touch sensors, equivalent to, analogous to, the whiskers, the vibrissae of mammals. And so one possibility is that whiskers came first, so some sort of touch-sensitive structure on an otherwise scaly animal. And that, that was then co-opted, it was exapted, or exaptation, by evolution to produce an, an insulatory body covering and a display body covering, and then ultimately these other locomotory features. Total speculation. We don't have data to support that. But it's something worth considering. And I will say, in the origin of mammals circles, among paleontologists, that exact same debate goes on. Was it whiskers first or insulating fur first? And we don't have an answer to that yet. Okay. So, today, on to the new topic. And that is social behavior. So, ever since they were first discovered, paleontologists have uh, it's speculated on the behavior of extinct animals. By the way, in case that's an ambiguous reference, it's not the paleontologists who were discovered, it was the extinct animals. So, um, that's a joke! Okay, so, not a really good one, but it's a joke nevertheless. Um, and indeed, in many cases, the behavior speculated upon was which would, which would uh, kill another one in a fight. And thank goodness we're beyond that in the world of dinosaurs. No, unfortunately we're not. Most common question on the internet like you'll get is, what would win in a fight, X versus Y? Um, but they did more than that. They were animals. They had lives. They, in these lives, they had behaviors. But how can we figure out about the behaviors of these extinct animals? They're not doing anything now. They're lying around. And if you think about it, there's lots of interesting behaviors in, among nature. I mean, there are things like combat. Combat's definitely real. So here are giraffes showing what those ossicones on the top of their head are for, in part, in this fight for dominance. They will actually kill each other, not necessarily from the impact, per se, but if they manage to knock themselves or the other one out, if your head goes from about 18 feet high to the ground, that's a pretty strong impact. They can sometimes die as they come crashing to the ground if they knock themselves out. So animals engage in lots of serious behaviors. But, of course, there's lots of, uh, uh, and we might potentially be able to find evidence of that kind of behavior from the previous slide in the fossil record, the nature of the ossicones. We could figure out the mechanical strength of the skull. We could look for damage to them. But think of some of the other behaviors that animals do. That would be, we'd be really hard pressed to recognize in the fossil record. I mean, there are lizards that run on water. You know, you're not going to find trace fossils of running on water. I don't know where the, there it is. Um, 
not by trace fossils of animals running on water. Water doesn't preserve like that. Um, there are tool using otters, sea otters. What are the chances? They're not going to be found with the rocks in their hands. The chances of that happening are, are infinitesimally small. And think of all the weird behaviors, the dances and displays that different sorts of birds do. Well, that's not going to get preserved. And the features that are, they're showing off with are not typically preservable features as well. So we have to use the same set of stuff, and you've seen this slide before, the same set of techniques that we use for other aspects of biology. Analogies with modern animals, the phylogenetic distribution of traits, and one thing that's important, if we find a trait that's shared by birds and crocs, it is likely to have been present in the extinct dinosaurs. Although, on Wednesday's lecture, we're going to find out that that's not always uh, true when additional data come along. Biomechanics. You know, we had a couple lectures where we looked at aspects of biomechanics in understanding biology. They, dinosaurs, like all organisms, live in the world of physics. They are subject to uh, the laws of physics, and therefore we can reconstruct their limits. And things like the sedimentological and trace fossil record where we could see aspects of their behavior encoded either in the physical environment, in the case of trace fossils, or damage to the skeletons or things of that nature. But, you know, some behaviors and some traces would be really hard or even impossible to reconstruct without sufficient data that may be lost forever, you know, without a time machine. Now, what are some of the types of behaviors to think about? Displays, and I'll talk more about displays in the next slide, and actually for a fair amount of the lecture. Uh, comment. Oh, but if you can't read the caption, we're not sure what to call it, but we're pretty sure everything was afraid of it. Uh, comment. You know, animals do engage in combat both with each other, uh, so both with other members of the same species or with other species. You know, questions of feeding. There's questions of feeding there. Group behavior. Behavior in uh, numbers, you know, maybe pairs or more. Parenting questions, the questions about parenting behaviors, and so forth. So let's take a look at displays, for instance. These are maybe visual or sound or smell or other or combination of uh, behaviors where you're trying to convey a message. And there's different messages that animals convey. A very important one are courtship displays, sexual displays. You know, they, that is an extraordinarily important part of biology. And therefore, having some form of display is a very common attribute. Territorial displays. Um, a way to defend a particular spot that might have important resources. Those resources might be food or shelter. It might be mates. Uh, and so forth. And so here we see a male hippo defending through display its territory as part of a, a beach. And on a much smaller scale, a male anolis lizard uh, defending its little branch. This is my branch. And then more general defensive displays, not necessarily for territory, but for the organism itself. You know, how nature says, do not touch. And then a type of display that people often think about less, but is also very important, and sometimes related to these other. Species recognition. How do you let other organisms know what species you are? That might be important. That might be very important with regard to courtship displays. Um, it might be important with regard to territorial displays, to let them know, you know, I am a whatever species and not a different one. And those displays, in all those cases there, you know, sometimes they might be cooperative displays. You see those greaves dancing, or competitive displays. You see those male turkeys fighting. Now, additionally, there's the question of who is the audience? Who are these displays or other behaviors for? Is it within the species that is intra-specific? So we have some chasmosaurians up here fighting amongst themselves. Or is it an interspecific behavior between species? So here we have the giant Therizinosaur, Therizinosaurus, doing a defensive display against a couple of Tarbosaurus. 
uh, in order for you know, to protect themselves. Now, in general, sauropsids, that is, in the modern world, you know, birds, crocodilians, lizards and snakes, tuataras, turtles, but including things like dinosaurs, are generally very visually oriented animals. They tend to rely a lot on vision for many aspects, including behavior. Consequently, many sauropsids have visual displays. Now, not all visual displays involve preservable tissues. For instance, the beard of a bearded dragon, and I'm not certain which species of bearded dragon that is. It's similar to the inland bearded dragon, which is the one that we have in America as domestic pets. That might be just a different color morph, but there's actually several species of bearded dragon. It's flaring up that display, but the beard itself is unlikely to be preserved. You know, when it's not flared out, it folds back, it's soft tissue. Uh, the, the underpinning of it is, is firm tissue, you know, cartilage and so forth, but not bone. Or the dancing display there, the, the sky pointing display you see the blue footed booby doing, you know, we would have no way of knowing that an extinct bird would go into that particular posture. Because uh, it's just one posture out of the range of its motions. Or oh, here, this is the oscillated turkey, the cousin of the, you know, the turkey that we're more familiar with in North America. Well, in, in the rest of North America is gone in Mexico and Central America. Um, a much fancier turkey. Um, and although color can preserve somewhat in the fossil record, we'll talk about that in a later lecture, it's unlikely to, and most of the things that make this animal distinctive from the more common turkey are not preserved. That said, as we saw as we marched through the diversity of dinosaurs, many clades of dinosaurs were characterized by rather elaborate, broad, bony features. Things that stuck up against the body profile so that at least in one direction, they would look distinctive. So the crests of lots of theropods, particularly theropods uh, in the Jurassic, that's sort of the heyday of the crests. The epoxipitals, the horns, the frill shape of ceratopsids, of course. Different species as we saw, different patterns. The crests of Lambiosaurian hadrosaurs, the plates of stegosaurs. That's not to say that the dinosaurs that didn't have these big, broad structures had no visual display. They might have had visual displays of things like soft tissue structures, whether it's just colors on the body, or maybe soft tissue waddles coming off the neck, or what have you. But these, at least, are preservable. We could see them. Now, how about sound display? If you look at the phylogeny of vertebrates, the tetrapods, of amniotes in this case, we know that crocodilians and birds both make extensive use of sound displays. Birds, of course, everyone knows that. But so do crocodilians. Crocodilians, you know, they have all sorts of calls for courtship, for defense between parent and offspring, between offspring and parent, and so forth. Lizards and snakes and turtles, not so much. Some of them do vocalize, but they don't vocalize much, and many of them are essentially silent. And although some mammals, we primates, for instance, are rather vocal, and so are herd mammals and carnivores, Early branches of mammalia, the basal branches of mammalia, tend to be rather quiet. They tend not to make the use of a lot of sound calls. For instance, what sound does a kangaroo make? Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> they thought, yeah, how about a, 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 a platypus? Yeah. OK, um, so lots of branches, particularly towards the base of extant mammals, do not have extensive sounds. Uh, and so we can infer that extensive use of sound was a derived trait for Archosauria. And all other things being equal, we would infer that extinct Archosaurs, whether they're on the croc line or the bird line, would have also had extensive use of sound, even if we don't know what those individual sounds were. And are there osteological correlate for these uh, hearing type displays? Well, maybe. 
a lot of larger dinosaurs, as we saw, have expanded in aerial regions. So remember, there's the nearest uh, Brachiosaurus. Its nostril would be down here. You blow air through a sac. It's probably going to make some sort of sound. You know, there's another big nose on another type of dinosaur. In this case, it's an ornithopod. It's an iguanodontian. And, of course, famously, the Lambiosaurians with their hollow nasal crests. So those might be features that indicate that some form of sound is used in communication. That said, as I teased before, and will continue to tease until next, no, not next week. Yeah, next week. We will finally get to physiology. There's also a physiological aspect to this. But that said, sound generation is likely. And in fact, people have modeled both in physical, you know, actual tube models, as well as computer models, um, the crests of Parasaurolophus, this particular Lambiosaurine with a rather simple crest. Um, and they found that it generates sound of about the quality of a bassoon. So it sounds like the, the, the range of a bassoon, the sound quality of a bassoon, not a surprise, it is a long tube about the size of a bassoon. And again, we don't know what particular calls they would make. We can speculate on the types of calls. And again, these would be things like courtship, and um, defensive displays and so forth. Oh, and I should back up here. It's worth noting that, as you know, mentioned before, the crests develop only as they get older. So whatever uh, biological function the crests had, they were not important for babies. How about species recognition? Well, it's tempting to look at the crests and frills and horns and so forth of many closely related dinosaurs, like for instance these uh, centrosaurine ceratopsians, and assume the different patterns are for species recognition. After all, in modern, um, modern uh, horned animals, like antelopes, that's one big function. The reason the horns of, uh, you know, different antelope that live on the Serengeti look different, seems to be species recognition. If it was just for defense, we would expect the shape of the horns to be basically the same, but they're not. But, one problem with saying that these are specifically, these are definitely for species recognition, is no two of these dinosaurs lived at the same time. They didn't live at the same place at the same time. And so, the thought that uh, within small groups like this, that they're specifically for species recognition, um, is less strong. They may yet be. They may actually be. And, and sort of at the level of at least the horned dinosaur says, are you a chasmosaurian or a centrosaurian, even if there's only one chasmosaurian species and one centrosaurian species that lived in that region. That's still useful information. Um, but we don't see overlap of really closely related forms. Rather, we tend to see a succession of them. Similarly with stegosaur plates. We don't have overlapping species of stegosaur, typically, in the fossil record. But why display? What's the function of display? Well, in the case of territorial displays or defensive displays, so here we have a bunch of Styracosaurus, a, a Centrosaurine, uh, shoving off at uh, Displetosaurus, Tyrannosaur. Displays could be a non-lethal means to sh have a show of force. It's a way of showing that you can be a threat and that tangling with you could be dangerous without actually having to go to all the costs of combat where you might lose and certainly where you're going to be damaged. And in this case, it would be an honest territorial or defensive display. That's something you could actually back up uh, if you have this honest defensive display, that means both the aggressor and the defender can get away from it without having to expend excess energy. So if you've ever hung around bulls, don't do this normally, but uh, uh, they will actually go through a set of displays as they're getting relatively angrier and angrier, each one is sort of ratcheting it up. Oh, no, seriously, I can take you down. No, seriously, I can take you down. Um, and then eventually, you might push them to the limit where they go and charge and you know, chase you down the streets of Pamplona or whatever. 
That's it. Plenty of non-threatening animals have threat displays. And here we see a bunch of uh, bird and moon. Yeah, it'll follow bird and moon as a great uh, cartoon series of sort of natural history topics. But there's other reasons to have display, in particular in terms of courtship or sexual displays. It is thought, although it is greatly debated, uh, <laughs> there's nothing in biology that uh, is not debated, um, it is thought that in general, uh, and females are going to evaluate, I'll explain why females will do the evaluation in a bit, uh, a sexual or courtship displays on the part of males to judge the, that the males were strong or healthy, and therefore their potential fitness as a mate. Now, by judge, I don't mean conscious, rational thought in the sense that a human being could do. Uh, but natural selection favors those individual females that would preferentially um, mate with the males that have some sort of um, lack of obvious weaknesses that they tend to lose in fights, uh, or their wings or the feathers are asymmetrical, because those might indicate that they have like low tolerance for parasites and so forth, and your babies would not be so good. And so indeed, a lot of combat in nature is between males, uh, but unlike as shown here, often with females watching on. And the females can judge who is the winner of the fight. And it doesn't even have to be a fight. It can be a dance-off. It could be visual displays, like the peacock's tail here. Um, and yeah, so the function of the peacock tail, like I talked about when we talked about evolution earlier on, is a display to show that, look, my body's healthy enough that I can produce this gigantic tail. It's symmetrical. Um, and I can live with this structure, and, and even though it might otherwise hurt my fitness. But we'll come back to more bits about sexual display in a bit, but let's talk about group behavior first. So is there evidence for gregariousness? Gregariousness is the behavior of living in a group. There's a group behavior in dinosaurs, so packs and herds. Now, there is no official name for groups of dinosaurs. Um, you know, flocks we might use, because birds live in flocks. Uh, but I think flock of Brachiosaurus is kind of a strange term. Um, in mammals, we tend to use packs for, carnivore, for carnivorous animals, herds for herbivorous animals. You know, do what you want. But let's think about what are the advantages. You know, what are the privileges to being a pack hunter, for instance? First of all, why would we even consider this a possibility? Well, there is evidence for gregariousness in some dinosaurs. The primary evidence are what's called monospecific bone beds. So a bone bed is where we have lots of specimens concentrated on the same horizon, the same level. A monospecific one is where the vast majority of the bones are from a single species, monospecific. So for instance, back here, we have a number of different ind individuals of the ornithomimid, cyanornithomimus, that were found together. So if bone beds are made up of mostly just one species, that's a strong indication, well, it indicates that they died together, a strong indication that they lived together at least part of their life cycle. And this is especially strong if the bones that we find are individuals of many different life stages. Because that suggests that they live together as a group over many parts of their life. What we'd assume in a herd or a pack. Now, the monospecific bone beds are the best. Track sites can be useful, but a concern with the track site is the tracks don't necessarily have to be made exactly at the same time. They just have to be made at the same time, the same broad time that that surface was wet enough to accept the track. But that could be the space of hours or days or maybe even longer. So you don't absolutely know that those organisms were there at the same time. They could have been an area that many of them walked through. But as I showed before with this example, this does seem to be evidence of a pack hunt 
by large dromaeosaurids against an iguanodontian, but we can't absolutely say that it is. Or here, this seems to be evidence of a pack of abelisaurids that were moving together at the same time in the same region. Now, what are the advantages to being in packs? Well, on the part of a predator, being in a pack potentially means you could take down larger prey than you might do individually. And it's true that um, lions and wolves, so today two of the you know, archetypical pack hunting mammals, and for that matter, orcas, all of them actually prey outside their weight class. I mean, they really do take down animals bigger than them in a fashion that solitary hunters rarely do. And that's because they can work together as a team. Even not necessarily an organized team, although in the case of, of wolves and lions, definitely it's organized teams. How about for a prey? Or for prey animals? Well, it's not like they're going to team up against plants. That's not the goal. But if you're in a group and you've got more eyes looking out for predators, you have, you have a smaller chance that you individually are going to be surprised because there's a really good chance that someone else in your herd might see the predator coming and alert the whole herd. Additionally, we see in herd animals today that a herd as a group can fend off larger predators than a single herbivore alone. So in terms of, of both detection and defense, those are some advantages to living in a group, living in a herd as a prey animal. But let's think about this. Why live in groups at all? At first glance, and this puzzled um, some uh, evolutionary biologists for a while, it seems to go against natural selection. Because if you think about it, in terms of competition, your greatest competition will always be a member of your own species. Because they have all exactly the same resource requirements that you do. Not just some, all. And so you might think behaviors that make you really outcompete the other members of your species would be really favorable. So yeah, they have identical resource requirements, so ultimately the primary competitor. However, it turns out there are some very sound evolutionary reasons to operate in groups. Now, um, I talked about way back when I first talked about natural selection, I talked about both the individual, the point of view of the individual, but also the point of view of the allele, of the gene. And this is where that becomes important. And it's worth throwing out here that um, the biologist Richard Dawkins, who you haven't heard much biology from him for the last you know, 20, 30 years or so, but he got famous back in the 20th century by working out some of the math behind this, of how a gene or allele acting, quote unquote, selfishly, trying to make more copies of itself, will produce altruistic behaviors. So the gene is just trying to make more copies of the allele, but it does so by promoting behaviors where individuals, whole organisms, operate cooperatively together. One aspect of this is what's called kin selection. And we can use, we can sort of summarize it by the old saying, blood is thicker than water. Because there's a really, really, really good chance that your siblings and your parents and your cousins will have a far greater fraction of the same alleles you do than more distant relatives. So behaviors that promote cooperation with your close relatives will tend to promote more and more copies of those genes, of those alleles, than not helping out your blood relatives. So kin selection, favoring behaviors of close relatives. That's one advantage to doing group behavior in sort of this selfish gene approach. Another related one, but not necessarily as related, uh, is reciprocal altruism. The you watch my back and I'll watch your sort of approach. So if you're a group dwelling animal already, you already have some level of gregariousness. If you have a population 
that you know solo members expend a little of their energy looking out on occasion and calling if they see an attacker or something. Those ones will suffer less severely from predation than those in which there are slackers, you know, ones who might see a predator and not say anything, or cheaters, ones who will say they see a predator even when there isn't, because they think you know the other members of the group will panic and then they can eat that resource or whatever. Groups that act honestly in altruism for each other reciprocally, you know, will get the advantage of others calling out. And if they themselves are doing it as well. And so herds of animals that have genes for cooperation will tend to suffer from predation less than herds that don't have those or that have substantial numbers of cheaters and slackers. And so the idea is, you know, if you hold out at some small cost to yourself, you know, you've got to make the effort to make the, the announcement. Um, the chances are good that you'll benefit from another organism, another individual helping you out as well. And so over time, natural selection can favor these group activities on the part of these animals. OK. So that's about gregariousness. How about sex and sexual strategies? Well, in the vast majority of, of Terrestrial vertebrates, perhaps, oh, no, at least the vast majority, um, there is sexual, well, the dioecious organisms, organisms that are typically male or typically female. And by male, we mean sperm producers. By female, we mean egg producers. There are relatively few species of terrestrial vertebrates that do both, any one individual. Now, there is a slightly different strategy between these two uh, types of um, contributions to sex. A male could, in principle, fertilize many different females without a heck of a lot of expenditure of energy, because you know, they are literally doing the shotgun approach. In contrast, eggs, female gametes, egg cells, are much larger. They take a lot more energy to produce. And so the females are investing more of their bodily energy in producing a fewer, a, a, a rarer resource. Consequently, in general, females have an advantage if they are choosier because they have fewer you know, cards to play, if you want to think about it as a game in that sense. And therefore, males wind up often being the showier ones because they are what's being chosen along. It is in their advantage to show off that they have some, something more to contribute than other members of their population. Now, in some animals, but by no means all, uh, for animals that are dioecious, that have male and females as separate bodies, um, there is sexual dimorphism. It's not true. There are many species that are sexually monomorphic for you know, at least from a distance. You couldn't tell the males and females apart. But there are many which are sexual dimorphic. For instance, in this particular species of antelope, though that's one male and three females. That's not a grown-up and some kids. So they are different in terms of size. They are different in terms of ornaments. They are different in terms of color. And they are different in terms of behavior. Now, sexual dimorphism tends to show up only when individuals are of reproductive age. So young individual babies and young individuals, pre-sexually mature individuals of the same species tend to look very similar morphologically. But as they reach a point when they are sexually mature, which isn't necessarily fully grown. I mean, even within our own species, we are technically sexually mature well before we are fully grown. Um, then they begin to get things like sexually secondary characteristics. Now, not all of these are different in terms of osteological structures. For instance, almost every songbird shows some sexual dimorphism. And almost, in almost every case, it's just plumage. And therefore, it wouldn't be something you could see in the skeleton. 
But, and this is going back to something I dealt with very early in the course, or early in the course. When we're dealing with fossils, it's difficult to test if, two, if when we find individuals that look different from each other, are they two sexes from one species, or are they only two different species? And this is especially true if we just have a few fossils to work with. You know, when the sample size is low, it becomes very difficult. Now, you will hear claims out there about sexual dimorphism in some dinosaurs. And I'm just going to talk about here, those claims do not hold up. So, for instance, on this graph, there's a claim that adult T-Rex shows sexual dimorphism. And that some specimens, the gracile or slender ones, were probably male. And the robust ones, the more heavily built for the same body length, in this case, same female length, or, or, um, are female. The, uh, the argument for that is in modern predatory birds, the females are often more robust. And there is one specimen here, M one specimen here, MOR 1125, that is a bone texture that is associated with ovulation. I'll talk about that in a bit, so that's probably female. However, the scientists who did this graph violated a basic rule of statistics. That is, they didn't look at the distribution of data, demonstrate dimorphism by showing that there are two populations. They went in assuming there were two populations, coding them as two populations, and then testing to see if their division into two populations was there. But that was an assumption they had going in. They didn't demonstrate it. So is that true, or is it just continuous distribution? All organisms show continuous variation. And indeed, the specimen here is not at the far end. Notice towards the middle. It's sort of an average size individual, if you think about it in that context. So there has not been a demonstration of dimorphism, of two morphotypes, particularly because they didn't have other traits, like maybe some cranial feature to distinguish between them. Um, I already had all these texts here before, so you don't need to write it down again. But this shows babies, uh, female and male, the same species. But you wouldn't preserve that. Now, can we actually sex a dinosaur? Well, in some rare cases, we can. The, the eggs have actually been found inside the mother. That's the safest way. <laughs> if you've got the eggs that were being formed in the oviduct, we know it's female. But that's been very rare so far to discover. There are some dinosaurs that show a bony tissue on the inside of their long bones. If you really want to know the name of it, it's called medullary bone. But you're not going to be tested on that. Uh, that, is affiliate, that is associated in modern archosaurs when the female is ovulating. What happens is they grow extra spongy bone on the inside of the medullary cavity, so the inside of the long bones, and that bone is there to be resorbed, to become the, the calcium store to shell the eggs. So far as we know, only female archosaurs produce that, and only during ovulation. Now, some people have found what they thought was medullary bone in other dinosaurs. In some dinosaurs, that turned out to be pathological bone, which can look similar. There are certain characteristics you need to look at to show that it really is medullary bone. So statistically, the chances of finding a female dinosaur dying when it was in the midst of ovulating are pretty small. But it's happened a couple times. Otherwise, people try to infer, based on the rareness or the showiness of one morph, to say that it is likely the male. And again, males tend to be showier, to have bigger displays. So that's the argument there. It could be wrong, but at least it's an approach. So there we go. How about stegosaurs? You might think, hey, look, stegosaurs, it's got lots of plates. Maybe we could recognize uh, males and females there. A paper that came out about uh, six, six years ago looked at that, and they found that if you looked at the distribution of plate shape, uh, they had, based on the number of these plates and the relative size of the plates, what they thought were two distinct sexes. The problem here was these were isolated plates that had come off of the body in a bone bed. They were not attached to a body. 
And consequently, other work looked at individuals where we have the plates still associated with the skeleton. And what they were seeing, what that earlier study was seeing, was front end plates and back end plates of one individual, or, or of individuals, not males and females. That the front end plates and the back end plates have different shapes. Now, although sexual dimorphism is probably present, was probably present in many dinosaur species, um, it's really tough to say for certain. Especially because one very important aspect of dinosaur, uh, sorry, of, se of sexual dimorphism in the modern world is body size. But as we'll talk about in a future lecture, Wednesday, uh, it turns out that the growth patterns of dinosaurs were rather different from either living birds or living large-bodied mammals or living large body reptiles. In the case of birds and large mammals, childhood is relatively short compared to the full lifespan. And so for most of the lifespan, the animal is full sized. That's true of big placental mammals, of big of all mammals, it's true of big um, um, uh, of birds today. In the case of crocodilians, and big tortoises, they just continue to grow throughout their entire life cycle. They may slow down somewhat, but they don't necessarily achieve a full body size. Dinosaurs, non-avian dinosaurs, weren't like either. They spent most of their life at relatively small body sizes or growing body sizes. So here we see a crocodilian growing throughout its life. In the case of these dinosaurs, they spent a lot of time young, and they only spend a short period of their life cycle as full-grown adults. A very short period of time. They do have full-grown adults. We do have traits that we'll talk about next time that shows they are achieved full adulthood. But it's only for a short period of time. Now think about it. If the prime, one of the primary ways we recognize sexual dimorphism is body size of adults, then it works well if your species spends most of its time at full body size, because then we'll see two populations. But what if there is sexual dimorphism of body size, but you don't achieve full body size until at the end of your life cycle, so only a tiny fraction of specimens are there, it becomes difficult to say recognize between a not fully grown T-Rex and an adult T-Rex, or a bimodal distribution of adult T-Rex. It's just the, the, the statistics aren't there. We don't have the specimen numbers. And so additional work you know, went to look at some classic things, so maybe showier protoceratops versus less showy protoceratops, um, and you know, all sorts of detailed statistics on it. And they failed to actually show that they're dealing with true males and females, and rather it may be continuous distribution, and the larger ones were simply the oldest individuals. But at least we're getting good at recognizing growth series. So that is something that's changing. Within a particular species where we have many individuals, you can see the changes throughout the life cycle. So there's some hadrosaurs. Hadrosaurs we have lots of specimens of, so we can trace those out pretty well. Sometimes these changes may reflect changes of behavior. For instance, young triceratops and other chasmosaurines have horns that point vertically, the postorbital horns. Well, at that point, you know, most of the predators are going to come from above. As they get older and bigger, the horns start pointing forward, in part because that's where the belly of the attacker is going to be, but in part because as you get older, the competition within the species actually becomes important, and you're fighting with each other. A recent paper uh, came out this year, looked at face fighting as a sign of maturity in theropods. If we look at crocodilians, like alligator here, we see that there's very little face biting marks left in sexually immature individuals. And then they hit sexual maturity, and then the frequency of face biting, and those red marks here are showing these face bites, becomes a lot more common. Well, we've known for a while that many large theropods, and some smaller theropods too, have a lot of face bite marks on it. And in this recent study, they showed that little individuals um, have almost no face bite marks. But as they get older, the frequency increases. And so that looks like this might be 
the sign of sexual maturity in these guys. And that matches other studies where we see a shift of behavior in terms of diet and in terms of morphology, in this case, tyrannosaurids, at a certain age. And intriguingly, face fighting phylogenetically disappears at the time we get pinaceous feathers. So it looks like that the display of pinaceous feathers may have taken over from actually grasping faces as a form of display when you're of age. So here we see face fighting in all these earlier branches of theropods and not when we get to pinaceous feathers. So maybe they switch to flapping. All right, so that's a look at behavior, and in this case, sexual behavior. On Wednesday, we'll talk about the goal of sexual behavior, which is going to be baby dinosaurs. So we'll talk about eggs and baby and babies and growth.